Watch the entire video my lovely viewers, I mean from start to finish, to get the whole thing. Without wasting much of your time, let's get right into it. Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. In the build up to the 2021 general elections, yeah. we did see what's in that uh, collaboration between yourselves as an economic front and the patriotic front at that, yeah. at, at that particular time. Yeah. So does this mean that op an opportunity still remains available for you to have a similar partnership with the ruling United Party for National Development? We, 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 we haven't uh, reached that point. There is, uh, there is nothing that uh, has come up so far uh, in, the, in, in that direction. Okay. We we collaborated with the PF in the 2021 elections because the Central Committee of the party thought that that was the best thing to do. And the, uh, that memorandum of understanding expired at the end of those elections. So there's no partnership now between EF and PF or indeed any other political party. Do you get the collaboration building up to the election? Not really. Not really. Chimweka, when, when you make a decision in, in life, uh, you don't regret just because uh, things did not go your way or things did not go the way you expected them to go. I think that's a very negative approach to life. What you do is you take responsibility. If you failed like we did, you draw lessons from that failure and then you say with hindsight I'll do it differently in future. So we do lessons from that uh, uh, collaboration with the, the PF and uh, we'll do it better in future. What do you make of the state of the, the biggest opposition political party in the country, the PF, a party that you were once Secretary General of and yeah. looking at the wranglers in the party now, the factions that have risen from it. What's your what's your take? If 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 history is anything to go by, PF is finished. Whether they like it or not, whether Edgar comes back or not, PF is finished. If if history is anything to go by, PF is gone. Secondly, if they think that. Uh, what will sustain PF are, are court actions wrong, then they don't know history of how political parties die. So my short answer is PF is gone. They will be very lucky to redeem it from, redeem it from this situation. They will be very lucky. So you don't think the rebranding process is anything that will yield any results? Uh, look, if, he, if, he, if he, you are a football team and he, you, are, you are given an opportunity to, to change the team at halftime and you go into, what do they call it, the change room? Mm, the dressing room. The dressing room. You go into the dressing room. If he, you are, the color of your jerseys when you are playing in the first half was red. And you go and get green and give it to the same players that you are playing in the first half. Surely you can't call that a new team. You can't call it. It would be folly for you to say that you have rebranded and that this group of 11 will do better than it did in the first half. That's a folly of PF. That, that, that is the naivety that I see in PF, that the same group of people that brought PF down, in my view, I could be wrong, but in my view, are the same people that are rebranding themselves. Where, where have you ever heard that kind of rebranding? 
Same people. They are rebranding themselves. It can't work. We've seen some, some members of uh, the Patriotic Front who have made defections. Most of them are making their defections to the Socialist Party. Others have advised them to just join other political parties, the Democratic, uh, the, the Citizens First Party, beg your pardon, perhaps even the Economic Front. Are you, are you willing to open uh, your, your, your doors to the members of the Patriotic Front now? in the process also of rebranding. Yes, but we are very strict, I'll tell you this. There is, there is, a, there is a caveat for you joining the EF. We are very strict in terms of who joins us, especially from PF, because we know most of the PF members. We know the characters that are indisciplined, and they have never changed over the years. And we don't think that uh, they are coming to EF who add any value to our party. And that's why you see some of them do not even make an attempt to come to EF. Because they know I know them. So they can go to other political parties where uh, those political parties think, think that they are adding value you know, to them. They will not come to the economic front. Because they themselves have not changed. They have not changed. So I find it interesting when people, uh, you know, friends about this uh, 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 parading of so-called new, new members from the Patriotic Front. You know, I can tell you that they will not add value, you know, to... They have never changed in their habits. They have never changed in their attitudes. They still carry the same indiscipline, you know, they... They, 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 they were used to accustom to in PF. So, the ones that uh, are prepared to join us, and we have those that have joined us, the difference is that we don't parade them ourselves. And we don't call those people that come to our party from other political parties uh, defectors. We, we think that's a very demeaning that's a very demeaning term. We call them new members. Uh, but, but still, in the process of rebranding, yeah. despite the, these issues being um, in court, Mr. Mao Sampa insists that he's the legitimate president of the uh, Patriotic Front. Do you think he can make a good president of the party and with the members that he wants to work with going into 2026? Who are, who, from what we've seen so far, a number of them are different from those who served in government under the leadership of former President Edgar Lungu. I'll, 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 I'll not answer that question, but I'll answer it in this way. You know, my book will be coming out you know, or sometime this year. I've written a memoir, uh, and uh, if, you, if you get an opportunity to read my book, you'll find a paragraph or a chapter where... Uh, I've expressed myself for what, what I think about Mao Samba and the other leaders in PF, those that I worked with. So when can we expect this book to be out? It will be, be out hopefully towards the end of this year. I have not spared anybody in that book, including myself. So it sounds like you've got a, a few things to say about Mr. Mao Samba that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't be too pleasant for him. Certainly. That's my evaluation of him. That's my evaluation. So you don't hold, you don't hold him in high esteem? And if you asked me, the answer is no. And, and I'm not the only one. That's why even Michael said that the highest position he gave him was that of deputy minister. If he thought that Miles was uh, something better than that, I'm sure he would have given him a cabinet minister position. But the highest that he ever went was deputy minister. The highest that uh, uh, you know, um, Davis Mueller, who, became, who later became Secretary General of uh, PF, the highest he went, under Michael Sat, and had a lot of respect about Michael's judgment of uh, people's characters, was Deputy Minister. Okay? Somebody, somebody, well, now that you have brought that up, somebody said to me, sent me a WhatsApp message and says, you know, why are you running with this uh, dry joke, you know, that uh, the only role that Miles Sampa played during PF was to test, you know, the PA system and say, hello, hello, test, one, two, one, two, you know, why are you? I said, but this is not even a dry joke, this is the truth. This is the truth. There's no rally, which I attended myself with Michael Sutter and others, where Miles Sampa ever addressed, you know, the people. 
he had no capacity to do so. But he, but he, he, he takes pride in pulling great numbers for, for the Patriotic Front in Matera in, in, in 2011. Chabobog. Chabobog. So when, he, when he, the thing is collapsing, anybody, maybe not even anybody, but anything can take up the leadership. Chabobo Kamani. PF is, is, is in the ICU. So anybody can purport to be a doctor to get it out of the ICU. That's what is happening. Let's uh, get into the work of the president. We were talking about how earlier, um, in a nutshell, sometimes those who work in the civil service do some of these things to, in a way, almost sabotaging the, the presidency. The presidency doesn't endorse it, but they still do some of these um, shoddy works and uh, be unprofessional. Yeah. Yesterday he was um, speaking with permanent secretaries, controlling officers, government senior officials, and just warning them of consequences of not delivering. Let's just take a listen to this. Can you change the way you guys work? Memos. It takes one month for a memo to come back to you for sometimes three months. Walk over to each other's office. Just walk over. Three, four PSCs are sitting over designs of uh, teachers' houses under city. What stops you from doing that? Then you clear all the hazy areas. Focus on deliveries. Deliverables. Focus on outcomes. Don't focus on, oh, I wrote them a memo. They have not responded. So I'm safe. What are you safe for? You've not delivered what you Colleagues, there will be consequences for non-delivery. Cabinet office shouldn't be a barrier, it should be a facilitator to get things done. Sitting on decisions, spending expensively when you have a cheap alternatives with good quality, there will be consequences. And uh, even before this, the president has talked about the bureaucracies in, in government and how they derail some of these processes. You've also served in government. What's your take on this? Bureaucracy is part of government. Without bureaucracy, government will collapse. Okay? That's one thing that the church should realize. Bureaucracy is part of the system of government. It's inherent, you know, in the system. I think the issue is raising, in my view, is not even about democracy, it's about competency. And the problem that he has is that he has appointed people that have no experience in government administration. That's where the issue is, in my view. Not, not bureaucracy. Okay? The issue at stake is competency. That's the issue. And this spreads out, you know, in almost all institutions. Competence, lack of experience. If you don't know, you don't know. If you don't know, Please learn to ask from those that uh, you think no something about what you are about to do. Okay? That's all. So for me, I separate, you know, the two. I separate the two. Government works on memos. You must write. You must always communicate in writing. Not on WhatsApp. In writing. That's how government functions. Because the writing reflects the regulations under which you, you know you are making that decision. I always used to say when I was town clerk to my directors, if you write, you write a letter that is going outside or even an internal memo, the first question you should ask yourself is which rule or regulation supports this decision? If you find that you can't find a regulation, then that decision is illegal. Okay? So writing complements the regulations of government. I think the issue which I've seen with the UPND is lack of experience in government. That's where the problem is, in my view. If you are going to appoint permanent secretaries, you know, who ideally have never worked in government and they don't want to ask those that have worked in government. That's one of the things that I've put in my book, that maybe we should have legislation that says that at the end of every administration, when we are transiting from one government to another government, 
there must be a, you know, a piece of legislation that will obligate everybody to make a handover to the next uh, group. That they did in the United States. We've got that between the outgoing president and the incoming president. We don't have that in the civil service. That is causing problems for us. Government is not just, you know, a machinery where you, know, you just walk in and sit there like you want to drive a car as long as you find the car in the ignition and you think you can run the car. Government doesn't operate like that. You must know. You must know the parameters of your office. You must know the regulations that you know regulate the office you are occupying, and the decisions that you know you you make must be supported by law. That's where, that's where the problem is. That's that's the pitfall, main pitfall of UPND, lack of experience, and people don't want trust. Come on, that's my view. Uh, while he was addressing the, the, the senior government officials, he also uh, touched on a very, um, others would call it a sensitive issue, but it's, it's one that came up again this year, at the okay. beginning of the year, the issue of Barotsaland, and he says there's no country called Barotsaland, it's Western province. And earlier this year, we did see a, a video um, by the Ninyunganda uh, Mboho, uh, was demanding for uh, the secession uh, uh, of the Barotsaland from Zambia <coughs> we looked into. Yeah. What's your view on this? Because it's, it's something that has been an issue for years now, and uh, previous governments have also experienced this. Yeah, you are, well, Chimaka, that's, uh, that's a very important issue that you raise, and I'm glad you raise it. I... I I, I listened, to, you know, I watched the clip, you know, uh, where the president was saying, he, I think he was addressing one of his, his PSEs from Western Province, and he said to him, there's no country known as the Barosland, because we're a unitary uh, country, uh, state. Mm. And he's right. When we, we were in the, in the PF, first let me, uh, let me put it this way. There is a lot of misinformation and I think this is important. There is a lot of misinformation by those agitators about Barosland, which you, they, they are training out, disseminating, you know, to the Zambian public. A lot of misinformation. Okay? The, when, we, when you listen to this, this uh, you know, issue, the way they try to contextualize it, they put it as if he, uh, Kaunda duped, you know, the roses, not even the roses, they duped the people of Western province into coming into Zambia or joining Zambia at the time of independence. Okay? They actually misrepresent history. Now, I have discussed the Barosland issue in my book. And here, in summary, are the facts. Fact number one, in May 1964, just a few months before Zambia became independent, firstly, in fact, before that, Barosland was a protectorate. Northern Rhodesia was a protectorate under the British administration. In May of 1964, there was an agreement that uh, the protectorate called Barosland, which had a broader, broader geographical area than the Western province today, must be part of uh, a new sovereign entity called Zambia. And Kaunda and the Mitunga then, in May of 1964, signed what is now called the Barosland Agreement. It's a very small pamphlet. I'm exhibiting it in my book. So oh, that's going to be a very rich book. Yeah, but it's also, but also you must dip in your pocket. 
<laughs> you are going to get a copy. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Anyway, so the the the, the counter and the two men then signed the, signed this Barosland agreement. Okay, and there was no question, there was no duress. It's not as if God acted like a crook to dupe the Litunga. Because the Litunga was even more educated than Kaunda. Okay? So they signed the Barosland Agreement. In 1969, in 1969, uh, Kaunda introduces a constitutional amendment, number five of 1969, to Parliament which parliament was composed of MPs from Western Province then, or Barosland. So he takes a constitutional amendment to parliament to abrogate the Barosland Agreement. And that constitutional amendment is passed by the legislature, a legal entity of the representative of the people. Third fact, in 1970, Kaunda introduces another amendment, which was amendment, you know, constitutional amendment number 44 of 1970, which changed the name now from Barosland to Western Province. So all these steps taken by the UNIP government then were legal steps to which the representatives of Western Province were a party. When you listen to the conversation from those that are agitating, um, you know, or the enforcement of the Barosland Agreement, or the restoration of the Barosland Agreement, it's as if Kaunda just did these things, you know, behind the, their back. Wrong. That's not the correct, you know, thing. Okay? So, when Michael Sata was the president, I went to the president myself, and I said to him, listen, we can resolve this problem very easily. And the way we resolve it, I said to President Sata, why did we go for a referendum? Go for a referendum. Let the people of Western province now choose. We can go and campaign. Let them, let them decide. Free will. Free determination. Because there was a letter at that time which we, they had written again to the UN. Now, the United Nations doesn't run the domestic affairs of countries. And I can tell you that if Microsoft had not died, we would have resolved the Barosland issue. So I was happy with the comment from HH when he said there is no country known as Barosland. But also, I think the European government must do more and teach the Zambian people or chain out this information of how the Barosland Agreement came about so that those that are agitating for this do not take advantage of the ignorance of, of, of our people. It's five minutes past ten in the morning. Welcome back to Let the People Talk. Our guest is uh, the Economic Front President, Mr. Winter Kabimba. And before the break, we discussed quite a number of issues. But before we open up the phone lines, um, two uh, very important subjects I'd love for us to touch on. Health, but before that, also the fight against corruption. One of the stories from yesterday into this morning is uh, of the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, nabbing the Wama boss. Um, previously, just a few uh, days ago, we also heard of the uh, the, pre the, 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 the f now former foreign affairs minister, Mr. Stanley Kakuro, resigning in the ACC, also uh, looking into his his case. What's your general uh, conclusion of the fight against corruption in the country? Chimaka, uh, the the fight the fight against corruption has not been very uh, let me put it. It's, it's not a, been as good as people expected. I mean, uh, UPND in in the opposition uh, went to town accusing PF about all sorts of uh, acts of corruption. Uh, we saw people in PF 
walk from rags to riches within a very short period of time. We saw people in PF, you know, really uh, developing affluency beyond their means. Now, I served in the government myself. And I served in the local government system for 15 years. And I can tell you this, no government job, and I repeat, no government job makes one rich. If you are richer in government than you were before you went into government, then you have done something wrong. That's the, that's, that's the basic principle. Wait, please say that again. If you're richer in government than you were before, yes, then something is wrong. Then something is wrong. Really, others would, would see it differently. I mean, the people you interact with while you're in government, I'm while I'm, te I'm telling you myself, I'm telling you myself, nobody in the Western world would tell you that uh, they got rich when they got into government. Nobody. Nobody in the United States, nobody in the, in the UK, nobody in the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries would tell you, would give you a testimony and say that uh, they were better off serving in government than they were in the private sector. Nobody. Nobody. Because government is purely about service. It's not about the personal accumulation. Now, here is my problem. Uh, just another point, so before we move on. So, even with, with one having personal businesses, even before they, they, they got into government, but when they get into government and these businesses begin to do better, perhaps people want to um, get into business with those, with the, with the businesses that, that, that have been established, but the mere fact that you are a, in government, you are, you are a trusted individual, and because of the goodwill that you have obtained by being in government, there is no possibility for businesses beginning to do well because no, of that. If, you, if you're a serious businessman, Chimueka, when you get into government with the, our businesses which are hands-on, your, um, your business will get worse. You'll find your business in a worse situation when you come out of government. That's my experience. Okay? So anybody that is going to tell you that uh, they have bought uh, three farms out of their income in the government, they are lying. Something, there's something wrong or irregular which they have done. And I'm saying this because I served in the government. Okay? Can, and uh, in, 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 as far as gifts and so on is, is concerned, while one is, is serving in government. How can, how can someone give you a gift you know, to the extent that you can buy a farm? How can somebody give you a gift to the extent that you can buy two Mercedes-Benz cars? That's not a gift. That's a bribe. What is it that you'd have done to somebody as a government officer, as a government permanent secretary, as a government uh, minister, where somebody would gift you with a Mercedes-Benz? That's not a gift. That's bribe. That's a bribe given to you. Okay? Now, here is my problem. For both the government and those that uh, are suspected of corruption, many of our colleagues that were in PF, that are in PF, or that served in the PF government today, are being asked a simple question in my view. You have so many properties which you acquired during the period when you were a minister, for example. Can you please explain how you acquired the, these properties? How can that take you to retain five lawyers to represent you to give an explanation over that? I don't understand myself. If someone came to me and said, Mr. Kamimba, you have a house on Independence Avenue. Can you please explain, you know, to the ACC how you acquired that house? I don't even need a lawyer. 
I don't even need a lawyer. I can, I can simply go to court and say, here is my file, here is the offer from the council, here is, you know, the first installment that I paid, here is the second installment that I paid, here is the third installment that I paid, and here is the certificate of debt to transfer this property from the council to me. Simple explanation. So if you can't explain, if you can't explain how you acquired the, the property that you have, and you need to retain five lawyers to help you in that explanation, then there is something wrong that you have done. If that case has to take 20 adjournments, then something is wrong with the system. Okay? A few weeks ago, we read a story that one PS has three million kwacha in his account. Story came from ACC. That's about three weeks ago, a month now. How can it take three weeks for the Anti-Corruption Commission to establish the fact that uh, the fact whether or not uh, that three million quarter was properly acquired? They've got the bank account. They can go to the bank and trace that transaction. How can it take one month? for the ACC to establish whether or not there is an offense which has been committed. So there is a problem on both sides. Okay? I, I can't claim to be persecuted myself if he, all that the Anti-Corruption Commission is asking me how I acquired the property that I have. I can't, I can't claim no persecution. That's the most, that's the simplest you know, question for me to answer. I can't go and spend money on lawyers to establish that. That's the simplest explanation for me to offer under the sun. So, you don't grow from rags to riches in government. Immediately you do that, the red flag must be raised, that there is something wrong that you have done. You can't move from being a nobody and uh, all of a sudden you have 120 truck and trailer trucks. That costs half a million dollars each. And, and you're saying it's absolutely not possible for your businesses to do well while you're serving in no. government? No. No ways. That's why, that's why you see all those guys, all those guys, and this is not only about uh, now, but about PFO, even in MMD. Even though that you are in MMD, you can, you can line them up, those who purported you know, to look very rich when they were ministers, they are paupers today. How is that possible? How is that possible? How is it that uh, within two years of you being out of government, you are looking thin that you need a doctor to establish whether or not you are still healthy? How is that possible? Okay? So that's the problem that I have with the, this, you know, or issue about the, about the, corruption and the fight against the, corruption. About corruption and the fight. Uh, the, the, we need to open up the phone as well. Before that, let's quickly um, um, talk about the health situation in the country. Over 10,000 cases of cholera have been um, recorded since October 2023. Uh, COVID-19 has also been a surge in the, in, the, in the numbers. Four deaths have been recorded just this year. What's your take on how the fight against cholera is going and uh, also adding in COVID-19? Look, the easiest way, Jamaica, to fight cholera is to prevent it. That's the easiest way of winning a cholera fight. Prevent it from reaching the apex of an outbreak. If you don't do that, then you have a big problem. Because cholera is... water, contaminated water especially. Now, Lusaka is surrounded by 25 informal settlements. Lusaka is quarantined by 25 informal settlements, possibly more now. 
That's a figure that we had as Rusaka City Council when I was town clerk. Possibly more now. The, the, the public health conditions, the sanitary conditions in these 25 you know, informal settlements are deplorable, to say the least. And the, the government should have been focusing by now not only this government, even the, even the previous government, they should have been focusing on how to provide clean water to these informal settlements because cholera is a waterborne disease and it would not reach the epidemics where we know of the figures where we are today. So you will fight cholera now and probably win after having spent colossal amounts of money we don't even plan as an African government how to deal with the calamities such as this one that's why every time you know you have an outbreak like this you have to run to the so-called donors and they start crying like small babies as a government. In fact, with that said, come and help us. With that said, would you advise that uh, uh, if declared a public health emergency, it and, is, and, and we seek help from from uh, the external aid? It is, it is. But you see, one of the arguments that I've always held, you know, and and and, and, and I still hold that view very firmly, is it is high time that we dealt with our own planning. This idea of running, you know, to the West, it's embarrassing. 59 years after independence. But you can't control cholera. Look at what happened during COVID. This population would have been decimated. The African population would have been decimated. Because what happened, the guys in the West first discovered, you know, the, 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 the vaccine used it you know, to serve their populations and then after that to make to NASA that they talk to talk last to they gave that to us. Can't we draw lessons as Africans from these developments? Look at AIDS. Up to today we are still dependent on the ARVs being donated to us. Up to today. I've never heard the Minister of Finance pronounced in his budget presentation that so much money has been given, you know, to the Minister of Health to, to you know, to, to, to buy ARVs. We are still at the back and call of the uh, American, you know, benevolence. You know, oh, you know, we have, you know, so every time you receive, you know, ARVs, there is a ceremony. Without shame. We are not even ashamed, you know, to, to beg. We have lost the sense of public shame to be beggars as a people. And indeed, speaking of the public, let's uh, engage the listener to come through. 0978-895-895 or 0211-226841. In case you've just joined us, our guest is the Economic Front President, Mr. Winter Kamimba. Uh, as you come through, please keep your contributions within a minute so that we accommodate as many callers as possible and get a response from our guest. Uh, good morning, Mr. Uh, Winter Kamimba. Good morning, man. Good morning. Dr. Park, good morning. Yes, this is Dr. Flowers. For example, with the government, you can't say you are agreeing with our Republican president when you say Carlos and his own country. Our president is following in the constitution. The law which is guiding the nation is constitution. So there is no other referendum our president can go. In the referendum, there is only the governor. The Indian and that position is new people who left it and the right to who did it. So stop talking about that issue, Winter Karimba. You are not the right person to comment over issue of our president affairs. Who come to the nation in Rochi, the one who are talking about the meeting, telling of Kwata, 
Dr. Prout, can you please have a better caller? <laughs> we've got, a, we've got another caller. I, I don't know if you if you said this is a better caller, but we have uh, the Patriotic Fund former Deputy Secretary General, Madam Mumbi Pier, on the line. Good morning. That's the one I want. Good morning, Shumika. Good morning, Madam Mumbi Pier. Good morning, Honorable My Dad, Winter Kabim, and yes. Happy New Year. Good morning, my daughter, Mumbi Pier, and Happy New Year to you. You didn't invite me for Christmas and New Year, my father. Ah, uh, there is nothing to celebrate. What do you feel, Salah? I have two things, honorable. The first thing is the address we had from the president to the permanent secretary. For me, I consider that as just public appeasement. He was telling his PSS things which they don't follow. In short, the way I see the president, Uchivalanda, now I'm even wondering in Gavalaya Kumba, if Yangavalanda publicly nicely, but they like to do things, these things. Why do I say so? We have heard the president on several occasions telling the inspector general of police not to arrest people before they finish investigations. And I'll take an example of what is happening today. Today marks five days since Madame Shikakuasha was incarcerated in the police cells. And what we have heard, we have been hearing, is that the police are still investigating. Under our law, she's supposed to be taken to court if they have found something within 48 hours. If they haven't found anything, she's supposed to be released. Why keep a woman, an old woman, in police cells today five days with no charge? We have these pandemics, two of them, COVID and cholera. My father, me, I was arrested. I was charged within two days. I was taken to the prison. When they take you to police cells, they don't screen you. It's only when I went to the police or to the prison that they discovered that I had COVID. Because at prison, they screened me. So is it fair that a woman can be kept for five days? with no charge and the, the president has told the police not to keep people within 48 hours are they listening to him the second one is on corruption we saw the minister of foreign affairs selling a mine on a piece of paper which looks like he just picked it maybe even from the dustbin made an agreement there we saw cash being given to him. There, you can even see that that minister didn't use the, pro the proper procedure, even if it was this private business, to make a transaction. He didn't even present RIA, and everything has gone quiet. And is this a clear sign? You can also see that the selective way of in the application of the law. And as I conclude, I'm so surprised why the president is quiet over Forest 27, which he said was going to demolish because there was corruption. They are quiet now because I told them, even your own MPs have land in that Forest 27, and yet we can see people in Kasunte, their houses being broken. I would want to hear right. your comments, my dear father. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, quite a number of issues have been brought up there by uh, Madam MBP. Yeah, I think she raises very important issues. Mm. You know, let me let me handle them one by one. 
the, the first one on Mrs. Shikapasha, I think I touched briefly on it, although I didn't mention the name. This has to do with the principle of uh, the presumption of innocence, which is provided, which is guaranteed actually in our constitution, that you are presumed innocent until you are proven guilty. So, uh, Amundi Piri is right, and she is also talking from experience, that the, the government, the Human Rights Commission, the UPN government, should be seen to uphold this presumption of innocence. There is no need why HH should be talking about the rule of law and preaching it every day without observing things like the, 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 the civil liberty guaranteed under the Constitution in respect of the presumption of innocence. But, but also just on that, she, I mean, she also spoke about the 48 hours, but we were aware that uh, even as the police are still investigating that matter, there's a murder allegation yes. here. So keeping that in mind, especially with the legal uh, background, um, how, how, how would you exactly respond to that? Because what? it's been five days, but there's a, there's a murder allegation here. Well, no, what I have seen myself, you know, the problem with you in this country, we are too timid, you know, towards the truth. What I have seen myself in other countries is that uh, police would give the public a regular update. Okay? General Shikapasha was a public figure. And all of us are interested as to the circumstances leading to his death. So, the police command by now, or the Minister of Justice, or the Minister of Home Affairs, should have given the country an update as to what circumstances you know, they suspect to have led to the death of General Shikapasha. And once you do that, the people then appreciate why the suspects are being kept beyond the prescribed 48 hours. That's what we see in other countries. What we, are, what we are getting now, we are just getting, you know, bits and pieces of information from members of the family. Now, you don't even know where the truth lies. So I think the police would do a better job than they are doing by giving an update over this matter. The other issue that uh, is related to this is that really, if the president were serious about uh, civil liberties, he would be firing his IGs every month. IG Musamba should have gone a long time ago if the president were to be serious about uh, uh, how this man is performing his job. And I think that's the point that Mbipi is raising. It is a very valid point. Does the president say one thing in public and another thing in private to these guys? Or if what he says in public is true, why doesn't he take action when these guys don't comply with his instructions? The third thing is about well, that she raises is about uh, But even, even on that, we, we've seen a uh, an inspector general uh, have his, his his appointment terminated after how many years? Under, under President Obama. After how many years? And after uh, after he has he has done how much damage? How much damage it should do Musamba do before the president takes action against him? So you're saying immediately he notices something, he has to instantly you dismiss. You must show him the door. You must show him the door. Okay? He doesn't have to wait until you know this ground swell, you know, of 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 of, of anger from the public it drowns you know him. No, he must take action immediately. He is performing those functions on our behalf. Okay? The third thing that the uh, BP raises is uh, the issue of corruption. Now, I'm glad I didn't want to pick on the uh, on the Stanley Kakubo. Uh, Stanley Kakubo is, uh, firstly, I don't know the man. I've never met him. 
saw is not my friend. I know him from the press as a foreign affairs minister, or I knew him. But let me say one thing, and I disagree with this very strongly. Kakumo's action was not corruption. Okay? What he did was not corruption. It was, of course, morally reprehensible for a leader in his position, but that was not corruption. Kaku was involved, and Mbipiri says, he puts it correctly, that he was involved in a private transaction. Buyer and seller. A contractual transaction. The state didn't lose any money. The money that he received was not gratification. So the man was not involved in any act of corruption. And that's why it was difficult for the president to fire him. All that he had to do is ask him to resign on moral grounds. So for me, if you want to pick on Kakubo's case, no, that's but, but, but if that's you, not a good example of corruption. Even really that, it's not exactly clear that the president asked him to do so, because from, from, from what uh, the statement was, the president only accepted the resignation of Mr. Kakubo. So that, that, that could be just him, out of his own right, deciding to resign on moral grounds. No, the train of events, you know, uh, uh, was that if he, if he what he, uh, one of the uh, uh, print uh, uh, media news circulations was correct. The headline was uh, 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 these Chinese, you know, what was the headline? The, 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 the Chinese demanding, you know, whatever from Kaku. And then the subheading was that uh, the president had uh, summoned Kakubo to community house. So there was a discussion between the president and Kakubo before he resigned. And I said to myself, even before Kakubo's resignation, that I don't see the president firing this man. Because there's nothing wrong with that he has done in terms of corruption. So I'm sure, and this is just conjecture, Kakubo must have said, but uh, Your Excellency, these guys, you know, I offered them my mind. They paid me part of the money, and then we disagreed, you know, and, uh, you know. So, the best I can do morally, let me just resign. And I think that was very honorable on his part. What surprised me was uh, a day or two later, there is a report that uh, ACC has gone to invade his house. Just to, just to sensationalize the whole thing. Okay? There's no corruption in Kakubo's case, as far as I'm concerned. Nothing. Uh, very briefly, uh, first 27, before we take in more calls. But I mean, also asked about uh, your take on the first 27. She, she, she is correct. There are too many, there are too many guilty people. There are too many sinners in respect of Forest 27. They are both in PF and UPND. I remember my young brother, Gary Combo, the Minister of Law, Government and Housing, standing up on the floor of the house, debating very intelligently before they got into power. That, that Forest 27, you will see when we win in a few months' time, we shall bring it down. They have failed to bring it down. Why? Because they discovered later that the sinners were not only from PF, they were also from UPND. And that's what has compromised it. But I also said one thing, you know, about Forest 27, that it is from a local government perspective, that it is not always true that what you do is to demolish those houses. You can also regularize them. You can also regularize them. You can regularize the properties and ask those guys to submit drawings to Lusaka City Council and get them regularized. So, the, the sinners around the forest, they can lander themselves. There is a legal channel that they can use to do the correct thing. 0211226841 or 0978895895. Good morning. Hello, good morning, sir. You have to let the people talk. What is your name, sir? Uh, Tom Gekko, from Chingwad. Please go ahead. Hello? You can go ahead. We're hearing you. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, I want to make a comment on, 
Ana de Bourin Batarimba, on the let the report talk. He mentioned uh, a lot of issues, more especially on the issue of uh, corruption with the uh, PF, without uh, mentioning on the the UPND. So it's like uh, the visit of Winter Kalimba to the president. He did not visit that. Uh, his visit was not to talk about the family issues. From the way he's speaking, you can even get something out from it that is now the hard gun of uh, the government of UPND. Because there is no way a person who is an opposition uh, gunning down the opposition and defending the the government in power when there are a lot of issues that are uh, affecting the people of Zambia, most especially on the issue of corruption. Imagine the foreigners seeing the corruption that has been prevailing in the UPND, but the person who is also inspiring the, the position of uh, the president has failed to recognize the corruption that has been or that is occurring in the uh, UPND. All right, thank you so much, Tonga. Let's take another call before we get the response from the guest. Good morning. Good morning, my brother Shmeta. How are you today? Good morning. I'm doing fine. This is uh, brother Shisha. Good morning, uh, President Sarimba. Good morning, sir. Um, we saw the peak on social media where you were invited to go to community house. Um, the way you are coming out, Mr. President, today, calling you to appear to be in the ICU, is that really necessary? Because for you and PF, you are in opposition. Why is it that you are targeting PF so much? The Lord is dead. It's what? Is it necessary for you to come out the way you are coming out? Does it mean that when we are invited, you were compromised in your principles because all what I know is that uh, people who are in the opposition, uh, you, it, there's no need for you to fight each other because you belong to opposition. But for you, the way you are coming out today, Mr. Kabimba, it shows that uh, you are compromised in one or the other. What is the, what is the aim of for attacking your colleagues whom you are in, PA, uh, in the opposition together? Calling them names, I think it's not necessary. For me, also, what I know is that, yes, you have a right to condemn, but not to judge to say no PF is dead, going by history. History is, it's there to, to, to show us something. But at the same time, um, PF is, you cannot compare PF to MMD, neither to uh, uh, UNIS. Because after the MMD lost the election, they went almost to just... Uh, Brother Chisha, thank you so much. Uh, I think we've gotten your point. Let's, let's um, get your response, Mr. Mr. Kabimba. Let's start with Tonga's contribution. He feels, and it's uh, quite similar to uh, Chisha's contribution, where they feel that you have been compromised since your visit to Community House. I know we touched on this earlier, but others still don't seem convinced that uh, you still remain neutral and an independent thinker. Let, let, let me start by quoting one philosopher, Immanuel Kant. You know what he says? If the truth shall kill them, let them die. If the truth shall kill them, let them die. Okay? I am, and I've, I am a very, very consistent person. What has shamed many people? What has shamed many people is my meeting HH. Because the, the, the picture out there of that I hated HH. The picture out, of the, uh, out there of that, you know, I was bitter against HH. So they are shamed now. And I've said to you that I met ECL many times when he was president. We spoke on the phone with ECO many times when he was president. Now, let me also say this. The issue of corruption in PF, I said it during Michael Sata's era. The man that I loved so much, Bachisha, if you, if, you, if you don't know. There was a headline in the post during Michael Sata's era that I said there was corruption in PF under Michael Sata and that there was tribalism in PF under Michael Sata. 
So you are, you are not hearing this from me for the first time because see, I've just come back from community house. But, 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 but maybe you can also understand the, the, the trail of thoughts for some people. You have rightly said you interacted with former president, then president Edgar Lungu, yes. uh, a number of times, and it eventually ended with a collaboration building up to the 2021 elections. Yes. So are people being unreasonable to think the same now that you've been to community house? The next expectation is you're going to collaborate with the ruling UPND no, and no, speak no. the same language as no, them? No, 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 no. That is, you know, the logic you are pursuing is, is, is one which my professor was saying, a chicken has two legs and a human being has two legs. Therefore, a human being is a chicken. Okay? Logically, it is correct, but the conclusion is wrong. I didn't, I, I, I didn't visit or speak to ECL just because of the collaboration. I've continued to speak to ECL even after he lost power. If you remember, when his wife was at Ibex police station, I went there to visit the wife, to find out what is going on. Where was Bachisha and the other man from Chingol? They didn't see those pictures. They didn't see those pictures. I went to see ECL when he has nothing now, when he's out of power. So when you ask me a question, what I think about PFO, I'm going to say the truth. If the truth doesn't please Mr. Chisha, tough. If Mr. Chisha wants to twist the truth that I'm saying, I'm being truthful now because uh, I've just come back from uh, community house, that's his opinion. Now, let me also say this. He says, you know, there are foreigners that are seeing uh, uh, corruption in uh, in uh, UPND. The point that I've raised, and I said this even before I went to community house. Kakubo, the issue came before I went to community house. I said it. Ask my colleagues that are here in the studio. Chikolete is here with me and others. I said to him, there is no corruption here. Just before I went to community house. Okay? Then he's saying, you know, but why are you attacking P PF? To tell the truth about PF is not an attack, sir, on PF. No. That is the truth. The point I raised was, if history is anything to go by, and you can mark my words, you can mark my words, PF will be lucky to survive. Because I've seen political parties that have lost power. And the, how they have mismanaged themselves. Yeah, but, but just on that, just okay. on that, on, uh, even with, with, with political parties losing power and eventually destabilizing, uh, and we didn't really touch on this, but the, one of the major allegations now is that the UPND has got a hand in the affairs of, of, the, of the party. They have disputed these allegations. The president has been on record. The government spokesperson has been on record dispelling these rumors. But those within the party, especially from one faction of the party, still maintain that that is the case. Look, if he, you have a problem with your wife and one of you takes that problem outside the house and the fellow one of you is talking to outside the house he compounds the problem, you can't blame the outside. Okay? You can't. If you and your wife have failed to resolve a problem, and you think, and one of you falls the victim, you know, to an outsider who doesn't mean well, you can't blame the outside. That's a problem. Why don't you want to hear the truth? If PF has, has problems, and, and some of the members of PF find themselves victims in the wrong hands of UPND. Is that UPND's problem? It's still a PF problem. That's my view. That is my honest, honest view. Let's take in some more calls. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. You're through to let the people talk. Who's on the line? Uh, uh, I mean, the line is not very clear, but uh, let's 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 hope we'll be able to hear what you're saying. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I, would, uh, I would love to advise today. Um, initially, you were a very credible, credible leader, and I used to, uh, you know, to believe it uh, because you would know, be At this time around, but you are now uh, joined the bank of uh, a, you know, a team of political. Uh, to start with, um, earlier you, you mentioned, you talked about, uh, you know, um, some uh, public officers, uh, for instance, the police uh, IG, may be over zero, like, like uh, an example of uh, what transpired uh, during the year of Iraq. But then you, you, you completely ignored that it is still the problem of leadership. Like you mentioned, if he paid his shadow over the leadership and he called uh, the minister in charge, and that's the uh, minister in charge corrected the situation. That's the reason why uh, those police officers withdrew from your, uh, from your camp. However, again, you are contradicting yourself when it comes uh, to the issue of, uh, you know, President uh, uh, HH dealing with uh, uh, who is this, uh, uh, the IG. Because it simply means if the IG can error and, um, you know, the president does nothing or the means of, um, uh, you know, home affairs does nothing to attack, then they are actually approving of whatever. Okay, we'll, we'll have to let Kamenia uh, go. Due to time, let's take in the last uh, call here before we get a response. Remember to keep your contributions very brief. Good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you? Very well, Brother Morgan. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody, and good morning, the listeners, and good morning, uh, Comrade Winter. Yes, very briefly, uh, Mr. Morgan, please yeah, go ahead. Let me uh, quickly point out to you that. Uh, uh, issue which has raised is that uh, there is no balance land. Yes, we are still one Zambia, one nation. But it was there. Kaunda died. Why didn't you ask him? Because he was a, a witness who signed that land. But it is one Zambia, one nation. That we don't want to divide the nation. But only one Zambia, only one flag. You go to a rest and find one. There's some Zambian flag which is there. But it was agreement. That's a fact. The last three, Comrade Winter Kabimba was, uh, uh, in terms of fighting cholera, he was a town clerk, Osaka City clerk. How did you plan the Osaka City uh, the way drainages are today? Are you the one who caused it? Because he was a clerk. The, the planning was on your hands. So we don't have drainages. We need proper drainages in the city. Because right now, go to town center, you find the flood is there. Town center, that near terms of them. How did you plan, guys? Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for coming through, brother Morgan. Uh, let's start with uh, Kaveng, who was, was, was just trying to um, understand your perspective on, on how the the the, uh, the president is supposed to act in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where people who he appoints are not performing effectively. You made reference to former president Ed Galungu and made reference to President Ejilema. But also, while you're answering this question, uh, I would like to, to also find out from you how the president is expected to act when, at the same time, these institutions are expected to act independently. Because the argument is these police officers are doing their work without approval from, from uh, the president. When the president sends these people, politicians will complain and say the president is sending them. But when the president gets interferes again in their favor, there will be the same people clapping. So do politicians want the president to interfere or not in the affairs of these institu institutions? Uh, look, I think, I think we are going in circles. Mm. I, I, I alluded to that during this discussion. And I think uh, my, my, my anchor of that point uh, was Mumbipiri's uh, submission. Okay? And I agreed with Mumbipiri. Mumbipiri's submission is this. It seems the president says one thing in public and says another thing to these guys in private. That's Mumbipidi's submission. And I agree with that. 
Why do I agree with that? Because if the president did not do that, he should do fire the officers. Simple. Simple. Okay? If the president thinks that the IG is not complying with his directive, with his instructions, I said earlier, and the phrase I used was, you must show him the door. Uh, by the way, uh, on okay. that particular issue, even of, of, of the police, I've, I've interviewed these other police spokesperson several times, yes. especially when um, certain, uh, uh, especially politicians, public figures, get detained for more than the stipulated 48 hours. Yes. And the explanation from the Zambia police is that it's the politicians themselves who delay some of these processes because maybe some of them want to gain some political mileage and, and so on. No. There's delayed tactics, and that's what leads to that. So if, imagine if the president asks such a question to his appointee, the IG, and that's the feedback he's getting. Do you really expect the president to dismiss his, his IG when that's the information he's getting? No, no, no. no. Look, we are not casting this argument in a concrete. Okay? There, there could be different dimensions, you know, and the variables to which, you know, but that explanation by the police is not correct. That explanation by the police is not correct. We, we have seen clear abuse of uh, the rights of uh, political party leaders in this country, deliberately so. Somebody will be arrested, and you know what happens? The arresting officer, the one who picked him up, just disappears. Mm. And then when you go there, you are told, no, the dealing officers are repo. And there is nothing that we can do. Sometimes they give you ridiculous bail conditions. That, you know, one of the sureties must be an employee of government. When they know very well that very few people would be willing to come forward, to step forward as a surety if they are working in the government because they are scared of retribution. Okay? That's, that's it. So it is not true. The police spokesperson, when you interview them, they are economical with the truth. Now, I want to get back to somebody who said uh, you've been uh, a critic, you know, of, uh, and now you see nothing wrong with you. No, I still see everything wrong. At the beginning of this discussion, I said, I made a statement right at the beginning when HH was so, you know, uh, uh, flying high, you know, about this IMF program. When Stumbeko Musokotwani, you know, was promising heaven on earth about this IMF program, I said to them, it shall not work. And I've said, it is not working up to today. So, what else, you know, do you want me to say? What I don't do is to play the politics of insulting one another. I will not insult anybody in the opposition. I will not insult anybody in the UPND. And this has nothing to do with the community house visit. I think that uh, the economy is uh, in its doldrums. It is a runaway economy. It looks like uh, HH, Musokotwane, the bank governor, have no idea how to manage this economy. That is the truth. But does that take away the truth, the, the fact, the, the, does that take away, the, you know, or from the fact that he, if you are asked to explain where you got, you, you got your money under PF, you should offer an explanation? No. Is that an attack? No. Chikwete seated here next to me, you know. If they went to him and said, can you tell us, he has a farm in Mikango Barracks. If the ACC went to him and said, tell us how you acquired that farm, he doesn't need five lawyers to explain that. Just him and myself can explain that. Maybe plus his wife. Three of us. We can explain that. So what is this view that uh, if we talk about PF, therefore we are attacking PF? No. If people did wrong under PF, they must be held accountable. They can't, they can't be left free just because uh, this is opposition. And for me, if you are wrong, you are wrong whether I'm with you in the opposition or we are, you are in the UPND. Uh, and and if you are right, you are right whether we, whether we are together in the opposition or you are in the UPND. And lastly, um, Mr. Morgan Chilonda called in and wanted to find out if you have any role to play in where we are at today uh, regarding the drainage systems with your background at the city council. That's a good question. That's a good question. This has been a cumulative, you know, problem. 
Okay? Chikwele is seated to my right here. He was the mayor of Lusaka. Okay? And cholera has been coming to this city over so many years. We dealt with it in 1988. When the late President Rupia Banda was the senior governor of Lusaka, we were given money by government. The point I was making, Chimweka, is not dwelling on the past. The point I was making, walking into the future, is that if you want to fight cholera, put measures in, pre in place to prevent it. That's how you fight cholera. And, I, and, and I've said, you know, that what we have, you know, uh, in Lusaka are 25 informal settlements surrounding this city. And all of them, you know, without any form of uh, sanitation services. That's what I've said. So my explanation is very simple. This goes to my brother, the Minister of Law, Government and Housing, if you want to prevent cholera in the future, deal with the, the you know, the, the other thing which is very important, uh, uh, I was going to lose my, you know, thought over this, is that uh, this, uh, this is also as a result of the collapsed local government system. I watched the president saying that uh, I've directed that uh, all shallow wells should be buried, you know, around the Lusak. How is he going to supervise that from the state house? How is the Minister of Law, Government and Housing going to supervise that? Does the President know how many shallow wells are in the Kamanga compound? Does he know how many shallow wells are in the George compound? He doesn't. Who should know that? The councillors in those areas. Who, who works with those councillors? The Lusaka City Council. So if you want to fight cholera and any other epidemic in future, make sure that uh, you revive your local government system. It can't be fought by the Minister of Health and the President and the Minister of Law, Government and Housing. They are lying. It's not possible. It doesn't matter how many trips, you know, the President takes to the Heroes uh, uh, Stadium. It doesn't matter how many, you know, demonstrations the Minister of Health, you know, gives us about uh, administering a cholera vaccine. Get back and fix the local government system. Then these public health epidemics will be brought under control. This is DJ Mutati exclusive. Alright, that's all right for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you. Peace. I gotta go.